Tarquin, or Lucius Tarquinius, son or grandson, more probably the former, of Tarquinius Priscus, had a brother called Arons, a mild-mannered young man. The two brothers, as I mentioned before, had married Servius's daughters, both of them named Tullia, but in character diametrically opposed to each other. By what I cannot but feel was the luck of Rome, it so happened that the two fiercely ambitious ones, Tarquin and the younger Tullia, did not, in the first instance, become man and wife, for Rome was thereby granted a period of reprieve. Servius's reign lasted a few years longer, and Roman civilization was able to advance. The younger Tullia was bitterly humiliated by the weakness of her husband, Arons, and fiercely resented his lack of ambition and fire. It was to Tarquin that the whole passion of her nature turned. Tarquin was her hero, Tarquin her ideal of a true man and a true prince. Her sister she despised for failing to support with a woman's courage the husband she did not deserve. There is a magnetic power in evil, like draws towards like. And so it was with Tarquin and the younger Tullia. It was the woman who took the first step along the road of crime. Whispers passed between her and her sister's husband. Their secret meetings grew more frequent, their talk less guarded. Soon she was pouring into the ears the frankest abuse of her sister and Arons, while Tarquin, though one was his brother and the other his brother's wife, let her talk on. You and I, she said, would have been better single than bound in a marriage so incongruous and absurd where each of us is forced by a cowardly partner to fritter our lives away in hopeless inactivity. Ah, if God had been given me the husband I deserve, I should soon see in my own house that royalty which I now see in my father's. The bold words struck an answering fire. Two deaths soon followed, one close upon the other, and Tarquin found himself a widower. Tullia, a widow, the guilty pair were then married, the king not preventing, but hardly approving the match. From that day onward, Servius, now an old man, lived in ever-increasing danger. His wicked daughter soon found that one crime must lead to another, lest the two murders should prove to have been committed in vain. She gave her husband no rest by day or night. Did I want a man, she urged, simply, that I might call him husband, simply to endure slavery with him in silence? No. I wanted a man who knew he was worthy of a crown, who remembered that his father was a king, who would sooner reign now than languish in hope. If you are indeed the man I think I married, I salute you as my husband and my king. If not, it had been better for me to stay as I was than to marry not a criminal only but a coward. Come, do your work. You are no stranger, as your father was, from Corinth or Tarquina. No need for you to struggle for a foreign throne. It is yours already. The guardian gods of your hearth and home proclaim you king. Your father's bust, his palace, his royal seat, his name and yours, in these is your title. You dare not? Then why continue to play the cheat? Why then let men look on you as a prince? It were better to slink back to Tarquini or Corinth, like your brother, not your father. Better to be humble again, as your ancestors were humble long ago. His wife's taunts pricked young Tarquin to action. To Tullio, the thought of Tranquil's success was torture. She was determined to emulate it, 
if Tanaquil, a foreigner, had had influence enough twice in succession to confer the crown first on her husband, then on her son-in-law, it was intolerable to feel that she herself, a princess of the blood, should count for nothing in the making or unmaking of kings. Tarquin could not stand against her maniacal ambition. Soon he was about his business, in and out of the houses of patrician families, the lesser families especially. He began to solicit their support. He reminded them of the favors his father had done them, and urged them to show their gratitude. To the younger men he offered money. As a bait, he vilified Servius, and promised heaven on earth should he succeed. Support for him increased. Everywhere his influence grew, until at last, when he judged the moment had come, he forced his way with an armed guard into the forum. It was like a bolt from the blue. But worse was to come. Taking his seat on the king's chair in front of the senate house, he ordered a crier to summon the senators to appear before King Tarquin. They came immediately, some by prearrangement, others because they dared not keep away, for fear of the consequences. All were profoundly shaken by the sudden and extraordinary turn of events, and convinced that Servius was doomed. Before the assembled senators, Tarquin proceeded to blacken the king's name and pour contempt upon his origin. He was a slave and the son of a slave. After his father's shameful death, he had usurped the throne. The customary interregnum had been ignored. No election had been held, not the people's vote duly ratified by the Senate, but a woman's gift had put the scepter in his hands. Base-born himself, and basely crowned, he had made friends with the riffraff of the gutter where he belonged. Hating the nobility to which he could not aspire, he had robbed the rich of their property and given it to vagabonds. All the burdens, once shared by the community at large, he had laid upon the shoulders of the wealthy, and distinguished the sole object of the census had been to make rich men's fortunes known and therefore envied, when it was not to plunder them for presents to the poor. While Tarquin was still speaking, a report got through to Servius, who in anger and alarm at once hurried to the scene. Standing in the forecourt of the Curia, he loudly interrupted the speaker, Tarquin, he cried, what is the meaning of this? How have you dared? While I live, I summon the Senate and to sit in my chair. The chair is my father's, was the insolent reply. A king's son is a better heir to the throne than a slave. We have let you mock and insult your masters long enough. Confusion followed. Some roared for Tarquin, some for Servius. The mob rushed the Senate House. A struggle was imminent, and it was clear that possession of the throne would depend upon the issue. Tarquin had gone too far to turn back, and it was now all or nothing for him. Young and vigorous as he was, he seized the aged Servius, carried him bodily from the house, and flung him down the steps into the street. Then he returned to quell the senators. The king's servants and retinue fled, while he himself was making his way, half-stunned and unattended. To the palace he was caught and killed by Tarquin's assassins. It is thought that the dead, it is thought that the deed was done at Tullia's suggestion, and such a crime was not at least inconsistent with her character. All agree that she drove into the forum in an open carriage in a most brazen manner, and calling her husband from the senate house, 
was the first to hail him as king. Tarquin told her to go home, as the crowd might be dangerous. So she started off, and at the top of Cypress Street, where the shrine of Diana stood until recently, her driver was turning to the right to climb the Urbian Hill on the way to the Esquiline, when he pulled up short in sudden terror and pointed to Servius's body lying mutilated on the road. There followed an act of bestial inhumanity. History preserves the memory of it in the name of the street, the street of crime. The story goes that the crazed woman, driven to frenzy by the avenging ghost of her sister and husband, drove the carriage over her father's body. Blood from the corpse stained her clothes and spattered the carriage, so that a grim relic of the murdered man was brought by those gory wheels to the house where she and her husband lived. The guardian gods of the house did not forget. They were to see to it, in their anger at the bad beginning of the rain, that as bad as an end should follow. The reign of Servius Tullius lasted forty-four years. It was a good reign, and even the best and most moderate successor would not easily have emulated it. One of its most notable marks was the fact that with Servius true kingship came to an end, never again was a Roman king to rule in accordance with humanity and justice. Nevertheless, however mild and moderate his rule, he intended, according to some writers, to abdicate in favor of a republican government, simply because he disapproved in principle of monarchy. But treachery within his family circle prevented him from carrying his purpose into effect. Now began the reign of Tarquinius Superbus, Tarquin the Proud. His conduct merited the name. In spite of the ties of kin, he refused Servius the right of burial, saying in brutal jest that Romulus's body had not been buried either. He executed the leading senators, who he thought had supported Servius. Well aware that his treachery and violence might form a precedent to his own disadvantage, he employed a bodyguard. His anxious, his anxiety was justified, for he had usurped, by force, the throne to which he had no title whatever. The people had not elected him. The Senate had not sanctioned his accession. Without hope of his subjects' affection, he could rule only by fear, and to make himself feared as widely as possible, he began the practice of trying capital causes without consultation and by his own sole authority. He was thus enabled to punish with death, exile, or confiscation of property not only such men as he happened to suspect or dislike, but also innocent people from whose conviction he had nothing to gain but their money. Those of senatorial rank were the worst sufferers from this procedure. Their numbers were reduced, and no new appointments made in the hope, no doubt, that the sheer numerical weakness might bring the order into contempt, and the surviving members be readier to acquiesce in political impotence. Tarquin was the first king to break the established tradition of consulting the Senate on all matters of public business, and to govern by the mere authority of himself and the household. In questions of war and peace, he was his own sole master. He made the and unmade treaties and alliances with whom he pleased without any reference whatever either to the commons or to the Senate. He made particular efforts to win the friendship of the Latins, in the hope that any power or influence he could obtain abroad might give him greater security at home. 
With this in view, he went beyond mere official friendly relations with the Latin nobility, and married his daughter to Octavius Mamilius of Tusculum, by far the most distinguished bearer of the Latin name, and descended, we are told, from Ulysses and the goddess Circe. By this marriage, he attached to his interest Mamilius's numerous relatives and friends. His influence with the leaders of Latin society was soon very great, and this gave him confidence for his next move. Declaring that he had certain matters of common interest to discuss, he summoned them to a conference at the Grove of Ferentina. On the appointed day, a great number of them assembled at dawn. Tarquin was late. He did indeed put in an appearance on the right day, but not much before sunset. All day, while the Latins were waiting for him, various subjects were discussed, and a certain Turnus Herdonius of, Af of Aresia had a deal to say in disparagement of the absent Tarquin. No wonder, his argument ran, that Rome has called Tarquin the proud. The name was already current through, as yet none dared more than to whisper it. It could hardly be better justified than by his present behavior, which is a deliberate insult to our country. We, the heads of the chief families of Latium, have been made to travel many miles to attend this meeting, and he who convened us does not even take the trouble to be present. Why? It's as plain as the pike staff. He wants to see how much we will put up with, and then, if he finds us submissive enough, he will stamp on us. A blind man could see he covets the sovereignty of Latium. If his own people were right to entrust him with power, if indeed it was entrusted, and not stolen, rather by a murderous thief, then we, you may say, should do no less. Even so, I would remind you that he is a foreigner, but what are the facts? His own people are sick of him. They are weary of continual slitting of throats, exiles, confiscations that are going on in Rome. And if that is true of Rome, could we in Latium expect anything better? Take my advice and go home, all of you. Do not trouble to keep your appointment here any more than he has. Turnus, who had acquired some influence in Latium, as an inveterate troublemaker, was in the full flow of his eloquence when Tarquin's unexpected arrival cut him short. The audience turned their backs on the orator to pay their respects to the king. There was silence, and Tarquin, advised to give some reason for being so late, said that he had been asked to settle a dispute between a father and son, and that, hoping to reconcile them, he had been unavoidably delayed. And as that little business, he added, has left us no more time today, I will wait till tomorrow to deal with the matters I propose to discuss. The excuse was not good enough for the angry Turnus. No dispute, he is said to have replied, is more quickly settled than one between father and son. All one need say is, obey your father or take the consequences. With this parting shot, Turnus took himself off. Tarquin was more disturbed by this incident than he himself allowed to appear and promptly considered ways and means of getting rid of Turnus. It would be politic, he felt, to make the Latins as much afraid of him as the Romans were. He was not as yet in a position openly to order his execution, so he decided to attain his object by having him convicted on a trumped-up charge. For this purpose, he managed to persuade certain political enemies of Turnus 
to bribe one of his slaves to allow a large number of weapons to be smuggled into his lodging. It was done within the course of the night, and very early on the following morning Tarquin sent for certain distinguished members of the Latin nobility, and pretended to have received alarming news, adding that his late arrival on the previous day had turned out to be a piece of extraordinary good luck, and had saved them all. Turnus, he went on, is, I am told, planning to assassinate me and the leading men in all the towns of Latium. His aim is the monarchy. He would have acted yesterday at the conference had it not been for the absence of his chief victim, myself. He was obliged to wait, and his consequent disappointment was the reason for the bitter language he used against me. I am convinced, if the information I have is true, that when we assemble at dawn tomorrow, he will be there to attack us. He will be well armed and strongly supported, for a great many weapons have, I learn, been conveyed to his inn. The truth or falsehood of this can be proved in a moment. Come with me to his room, and we can see for ourselves. Several things contributed to make the story plausible. The reckless plot was typical of Turnus. Then there was his speech at the conference, and lastly Tarquin's late arrival, which seemed a reasonable explanation of the postponement of the massacre. Consequently, they were all predisposed to believe it though they still needed the evidence of the weapons before accepting the other charges. When they reached the inn, Turnus was still asleep. He was awakened and surrounded by guards. Some loyal slaves who offered resistance were seized. Weapons were found hidden in every corner of the building. Further proof was not needed, and Turnus was arrested. Amid great excitement, the Latins were immediately called upon to meet. The weapons found in the inn were produced as evidence, and so strong was the feeling against Turnus that he was convicted out of the land, without even the chance of defending himself. He was bound underneath a hurdle weighted with stones and flung into the water, a form of punishment which was a new invention of Tarquin's. After the execution, the Latins were again summoned to Tarquin's presence. Gentlemen, he said, I congratulate you. Turnus was a traitor. He was caught in the act, and you had given him his just reward. Now I would remind you that an ancient treaty between Rome and Latium is still in existence, and that I could act upon it if I so wished. By that treaty, the whole Alban community, together with all settlements founded by the Alban people, were brought to by Tullus under the dominion of Rome. You Latins are of Alban descent, and therefore bound by the terms of that treaty. However, it is my belief that everybody's interest would be better served if the old treaty were brought up to date in such a way as to allow the peoples of Latium to share the prosperity of Rome, instead of being forced to dread a repetition of the miseries, the destruction of towns, the devastation of the countryside, which they suffered during the reigns of Ancus and my father. The Latins were quick to see the force of this, in spite of the fact that the treaty was more favorable to the Roman interests than to their own. Moreover, it was obvious that the most influential amongst them took Tarquin's view of the matter, not to mention that the recent fate of Turnus was evidence of what would happen to anyone who ventured to oppose him. The treaty was accordingly revised, and a proclamation was issued, to the effect that the Latins of military age should present themselves fully armed on a day fixed for the purpose of the grove of Ferentina. In accordance with the edict, 
men from all the Latin communities duly assembled. Tarquin then proceeded to take certain precautions, seeing it was inadvisable to allow them independent command, with their own general officers and their own standards, he reorganized the army units so that each company should consist of Roman and Latin troops in equal numbers, under the command of a Roman centurion. However, lawless and tyrannical Tarquin may have been as monarch in his own country, as a war leader he did fine work. Indeed, his fame as a soldier might have equaled that of his predecessors, had not his degeneracy in other things obscured its luster. It was Tarquin who began the long two hundred years of war with the Volscians. From them he took by storm the town of Suessa Pomitia, where the sale of captured material realized forty talents of silver. Footnote Roughly nine thousand I don't know, is that pounds? And a footnote. <laughs> this sum he allocated to the building of the Temple of Jupiter, which he had conceived on a magnificent scale, worthy of the king of gods and men, of the might of Rome, and of the majesty of the place where it was to stand. He was next engaged in hostilities with the neighboring town of Gabai. This time, progress was slower than he expected. His assault proved abortive. The subsequent siege operations failed, and he was forced to retire. So he finally had recourse to the unroman and disgraceful method of deceit and treachery. Pretending to have abandoned hostilities in order to devote himself to laying the foundations of the Temple of Jupiter and to various other improvements in the city, he arranged for Sextus, the youngest of his three sons, to go to Gabai in the assumed character of a fugitive from the intolerable cruelty of his father. On his arrival in the town, Sextus began to pour out his complaints. Tarquin, he declared, had ceased to persecute strangers, and was now turning his lust for dominion against his own family. He had too many children, and was heartily sick of them. His one desire was to leave no descendants, no heir to his throne, and before long was likely to repeat in his own home what he had already done in the Senate, and leave it a desert and a solitude. I myself, he continued, escaped with my life through the bristling weapons of my father's guard, and I knew that nowhere but in the homes of the tyrant's enemies should I be able to find safety. Make no mistake, the suspicion of hostilities is a feint only. War still awaits you, and as soon as he thinks, fit Tarquin will attack you unawares. You have no room in Gabai for suppliance. Suppliance. You have no room in Gabai for suppliance. Very well, then. I will try my luck through the whole of Latium. I will visit, in turn, Volscians, Aquians, Hernicans, seeking and seeking, until I find some friend who knows how to protect a son from a father's impious savagery. Who knows, but I may find, too, some spark of true manhood, some readiness to take up arms against the proudest of kings and the most insolent of peoples. The men of Gabai gave Sextus a friendly welcome, knowing, as they did, that any show of indifference would provoke him to leave the town at once. In their view, they declared there was no cause for surprise that Tarquin should be treated treating his children as brutally as he had treated first the Romans and then his allies. Brutality was his nature, and for lack of other objects, he would end by exercising it against himself. For their part, 
they were glad. Sextus had come, and it would not be long before with him to help them. The scene of battle would shift from the gates of Gabi to the walls of Rome. Sextus was soon admitted to the councils of state, where he made it his business to express agreement on all matters of local politics, which the men of Gabi might be expected to understand better than himself. On one issue, however, war with Rome, he took the lead. The advisability of this he urged repeatedly, pointing out that he was specially competent to do so because of his knowledge of the resources of both parties, and of his certainty that Tarquin, whose arrogance even his own children found insufferable, had brought upon himself the hatred of all his subjects. Sextus's words gradually took effect, and the leading men of Gabai were soon in favor of reopening hostilities. Sextus himself, meanwhile, with small bodies of picked troops, began a series of raids on Roman territory. Everything he said or did was so nicely calculated to deceive that confidence in him grew and grew until he was finally appointed commander of the armed forces. War was declared. Minor engagements took place, nearly always to the advantage of Gabai. Of what was really happening, nobody had the smallest suspicion, and the results of these apparent successes was that everyone in Gabai, from the highest to the lowest, was soon convinced that Sextus had been sent from heaven to lead them to victory. The common soldiers, too, finding him ready to share their dangers and hardships, and generous in distributing plunder, came to love him with such devotion that his influence in Gabai was as great as his father's was in Rome. At last he was able to feel that he had the town, as it were, in his pocket, and was ready for anything. According, he sent a confidential messenger to Rome, to ask his father what step he should take next, his power in Gabai being, by God's grace, by this time absolute. Tarquin, I suppose, was not sure of the messenger's good faith. In any case, he said not a word in reply to his question, but with a thoughtful air went out into the garden. The man followed him, and Tarquin, strolling up and down in silence, began knocking off puppy heads with his stick. The messenger, at last wearied of putting his question, and waiting for the reply, so he returned to Gabai, supposing his mission to have failed. He told Sextus what he had said, and what he had seen his father do. The king, he declared, whether from anger, or hatred, or natural arrogance, had not uttered a single word. Sextus realized that though his father had not spoken, he had, by his action, indirectly expressed his meaning clearly enough so he proceeded at once to act upon his murderous instructions. All the influential men in Gabai were got rid of, some being brought to public trial, others executed for no better reasons than that they were generally disliked. Many were openly put to death, some against whom any charge would be inconvenient to attempt to prove were secretly assassinated. A few were either allowed or forced to leave the country, and their property was confiscated, as in the case of those who had been executed. The confiscations enriched the more fortunate, those, namely, to whom Sextus chose to be generous, with the result that in the sweetness of personal gain public calamity was forgotten, until at long last the whole community, such as it now remained, with none to advise or help it, passed without a struggle into Tarquin's hands. Tarquin's next move was to make peace with the Aquians and to renew his treaty with Etruria. This done, he turned his attention to home affairs. His first concern was the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline, 
which he hoped to leave as a memorial of the royal house of the Tarquins, of the father who had made the vow, and of the son who had fulfilled it. It was his wish that the whole area where the temple was to stand should be sacred to no god but Jupiter. So in order to clear it of other religious associations, he proposed to exaggerate or secularize a number of places of worship, some containing sacred buildings, others an altar only, which had originally vowed by King Tatius at the crisis of his battle with Romulus, and subsequently consecrated with the proper ceremonies. The new work was hardly began when we are told heaven itself was moved to give a sign of the future greatness of Rome's dominion. For when the auguries were taken, the birds allowed the secularization of all the places of worship except the shrine of Terminus. The fact that all of the gods, Terminus alone was not moved from his place or called to leave the ground, which was consecrated to his worship, was taken so was taken to pretend the stability and permanence of everything Roman. Hard upon this happy augury came another strange event, which seemed to foretell the grandeur of our empire. A man's head, with the features intact, was discovered by the workmen who were digging the foundations of the temple. This meant, without any doubt, that on the spot would stand the imperial citadel of the capital city of the world. Nothing could be plainer, and such was the interpretation put upon the discovery not only by the Roman soothsayers, but also by those who were specially brought from Etruria for consultation. In view of all this, Tarquin became more extravagant in his ideas, so much so that the money raised from the sale of material captured at Palmitia, which was intended to carry the building up to the roof, hardly covered the cost of the foundations. This inclines me to accept the statement of Fabius, who is, moreover, the older authority, that the money was not more than forty talents, rather than the statement of Piso, who writes that forty thousand pounds, weight of silver, was put aside for the work. A huge sum like that could hardly be expected from material taken from a single town in those days, and it would be more than enough for the foundations of any of the most splendid buildings, even of the present time. Tarquin's chief interest was now the completion of the temple. Builders and engineers were brought in from all over Eturia, and the project involved the use not only of public funds, but also of a large number of laborers from the poorer classes. The work was hard in itself, and came as an addition to their regular military duties, but it was an honorable burden with a solemn and religious significance, and they were not, on the whole, unwilling to bear it. But it was a very different matter when they were put on to other tasks, less spectacular, but more laborious still, such as the construction of the tiers of seats in the circus and the excavation of the cloaca maxima, or great sewer, designed to carry off the sewage of the entire city by an underground pipeline. The magnitude of both these projects could hardly be equaled by any work even of modern times. It was Tarquin's view that an idle proletariat was a burden on the state. So, in addition to the major works I have mentioned, he made use of some of the surplus population by sending settlers out to Signia and Circe. This had the further advantages of increasing the extent of Roman territory and of providing points of resistance 
against future attack, either by land or sea. About this time, an alarming and ominous event occurred. A snake slid out from the crack in a wooden pillar in the palace. Everyone ran from it in a fright. Even the king was scared. Though, in this case, it was not fear so much as foreboding. About signs and omens of public import, the custom had always been to consult only Etruscan soothsayers. This, however, was a different matter. It was in the king's own house that the portentous sight had been seen, and that Tarquin felt justified the unusual step of sending to Delphi to consult the most famous oracle in the world. Unwilling to entrust the answer of the oracle to anybody else, he sent on the mission two of his sons, Titus and Arans, who accordingly set out for Greece through country, which Roman feet had seldom trod, and overseas which Roman ships had never sailed. With them went Lucius Junius Brutus, son of the king's sister, Tarquinia. Now Brutus had deliberately assumed a mask to hide his true character. When he learned of the murder by Tarquin of the Roman aristocrats, one of the victims being his own brother, he had come to the conclusion that the only way of saving himself was to appear in the king's eyes as a person of no account. If there were nothing in his character for Tarquin to fear, and nothing in his fortune to covet, then the sheer contempt in which he was held would be a better protection than his own rights could ever be. Accordingly, he pretended to be a half-wit, and made no protest at the seizure by Tarquin of everything he possessed. He even submitted to being known publicly as the Dullard, which is what his name signifies, that under cover of that opprobrious title, the great spirit which gave Rome her freedom might be able to bide its time. On this occasion, he was taken by Arons and Titus to Delphi, less as a companion than as a butt for their amusement. And he is said to have carried with him, as his gift to Apollo, a rod of gold inserted into a hollow stick of cornel wood, symbolic, it may be, of his own character. The three young men reached Delphi, and carried out the king's instructions. That done, Titus and Arons found themselves unable to resist putting a further question to the oracle. Which of them, they asked, would be the next king of Rome? From the depths of the cavern came the mysterious answer. He who shall be the first to kiss his mother shall hold in Rome supreme authority. Titus and Arons were determined to keep the prophecy absolutely secret to prevent their other brother, Tarquin, who had been left in Rome, from knowing anything about it. Thus he, at any rate, would be out of the running. For themselves they drew lots to determine which of them, on their return, should kiss his mother first. Brutus, however, interrupted the words of Apollo's priestess in a different way. Pretending to trip, he fell flat on his face, and his lips touched the earth. The mother of all living things. Back in Rome, they found vigorous preparations in progress for war with the Rutuli. The chief town of the Rutuli was Ardea 
and they were a people for that place and period of very considerable wealth. Their wealth was indeed the reason for Tarquin's preparations. He needed money to repair the drain on his resources, resulting from his ambitious schemes of public building, and he knew, moreover, that the commons were growing ever more restive, not only in view of his tyrannical behavior, generally, but also, and especially, because they had been so long employed in manual labor such as belonged properly to slaves, and the distribution of plunder from a captured town would do much to soften their resentment. The attempt was made to take Ardea by assault. It failed. Siege operations were begun, and the army settled down into permanent quarters. With little prospect of any decisive action, the war liked, looked like being a long one, and in these circumstances leave was granted, quite naturally, with considerable freedom, especially to officers. Indeed, the young princess, at any rate, spent most of their leisure enjoying themselves in entertainments on the most lavish scale. They were drinking one day in the quarters of Sextus Tarquinius, Calatinus, son of Egerius, was also present, when someone chanced to mention the subject of wives. Each of them, of course, extravagantly praised his own, and the rivalry got hotter and hotter until Calatinus suddenly cried, Stop! What need is there of words when in a few hours we can prove beyond doubt the incomparable superiority of my Lucretia. We are all young and strong. Why shouldn't we ride to Rome and see with our own eyes what kind of women our wives are? There is no better evidence, I assure you, than what a man finds when he enters his wife's room unexpectedly. They had all drunk a good deal, and the proposal appealed to them. So they mounted their horses and galloped off to Rome. They reached the city as dusk was falling, and there the wives of the royal princes were found enjoying themselves with a group of young friends at a dinner party in the greatest luxury. The riders then went on to Calatia, where they found Lucretia very differently employed. It was already late at night, but there, in the hall of her house, surrounded by her busy maidservants, she was still hard at work by lamplight upon her spinning. Which wife had won the contest in womanly virtue was no longer in doubt. With all courtesy, Lucretia rose to bid her husband and the princess welcome, and Calatinus, pleased with his success, invited his friends to sup with him. It was at that fatal supper that Lucretia's beauty and proven chastity kindled in Sextus Tarquinius the flame of lust and determined him to debauch her. Nothing further occurred that night. The little jaunt was over and the young men rode back to camp. A few days later, Sextus, without Calatinus's knowledge, returned with one companion to Calatia, where he was hospitably welcomed in Lucretia's house, and after supper, escorted, like the honored visitor he was thought to be, to the guest chamber. Here he waited till the house was asleep, and then, when all was quiet, he drew his sword and made his way to Lucretia's room, determined to rape her. She was asleep, laying his left hand on her breast. Lucretia, he whispered, not a sound. I am Sextus Tarquinius. I am armed. If you utter a word, I will kill you. Lucretia opened her eyes in terror. Death was imminent, no help at hand. Sextus urged his love, begged her to submit, pleaded, threatened, 
used every weapon that might conquer a woman's heart, but all in vain, not even the fear of death, could bend her will. If death will not move you, Sextus cried, dishonor shall. I will kill you first, then cut the throat of a slave, and lay his naked body by your side. Will they not believe that you have been caught in adultery with a servant, and paid the price? Even the most resolute chastity could not have stood against this dreadful threat. Lucretia yielded. Sextus enjoyed her, and rode away proud of his success. The unhappy girl wrote to her father in Rome, and to her husband in Ardea, urging them both to come at once with a trusted friend. And quickly, for a frightful thing, had happened. Her father came with Valerius, Valesius' son, her husband with Brutus, and whom he was returning to Rome, when he had met, but and when he was met by the messenger, they found Lucretia, sitting in her room in deep distress. Tears rose to her eyes as they entered, and to her husband's question. Is it well with you? She answered, No. What can be well with a woman who has lost her honor? In your bed, Colatinus is the impress of another man. My body only has been violated. My heart is innocent, and death will be my witness. Give me your solemn promise that the adulterer shall be punished. He is Sextus Tarquinius. He it is who last night came as my enemy, disguised as my guest, and took his pleasure of me. That pleasure will be my death, and his too, if you are men. The promise was given. One after another, they tried to comfort her. They told her she was helpless, and therefore innocent, and he alone was guilty. It was the mind, they said, that sinned, not the body. Without intention, there could never be guilt. What is due to him, Lucretia said, is for you to decide. As for me, I am innocent of fault, but I will take my punishment. Never shall Lucretia provide a precedent for unchaste women to escape what they deserve. With these words, she drew a knife from under her robe, drove it into her heart, and fell forward, dead. Her father and husband were overwhelmed with grief. While they stood weeping helplessly, Brutus drew the bloody knife from Lucretia's body and holding it before him cried, By this girl's blood, none more chaste, till a tyrant wronged her. And by the gods I swear that with sword of and fire, and whatever else can lend strength to my arm, I will pursue Lucius Tarquinius the Proud, his wicked wife, and all his children, and never again will I let them or any other man be king in Rome. He put the knife into Colotinus's hands, then passed it to Lucretius, then to Valerius. All looked at him in astonishment. A miracle had happened. He was a changed man. Obedient to his command, they swore their oath. Grief was forgotten in the sudden surge of anger, and when Brutus called upon them to make war from that instant upon the tyrant's throne, they took him for their leader. Lucretia's body was carried from the house into the public square. Crowds gathered, as crowds will, to gape and wonder, and the sight was unexpected enough and horrible enough to attract them. Anger at the criminal brutality of the king's son and sympathy with the father's grief stirred every heart, and when Brutus cried out that it was time for deeds, not tears, and urged them, like true Romans, 
to take up arms against the tyrants who had dared to treat them as a vanquished enemy, not a man amongst them could resist the call. The boldest spirits offered themselves at once for service. The rest soon followed their lead. Lucretia's father was left to hold Calatia. Guards were posted to prevent news of the rising from reaching the palace, and with Brutus in command, the armed populace began their march on Rome. In the city, the first effect of their appearance was alarm and confusion, but the sight of Brutus and the others of equal distinction at the head of the mob soon convinced people that this was at least no more popular demonstration. Moreover, the horrible story of Lucretia had had hardly less effect in Rome than in Colatia. In a moment, the forum was packed and the crowds, by Brutus's order, were immediately summoned to attend the Tribune of Knights, an office held at the time of Brutus himself. There, publicly throwing off the mask under which he had hitherto concealed his real character and feelings, he made a speech, painting in vivid colors the brutal and unbridled lust of Sextus Tarquinius, the hideous rape of the innocent Lucretia, and her pitiful death, and the bereavement of her father, for whom the cause of her death was an even bitterer and more dreadful thing than the death itself. He went on to speak of the king's arrogant and tyrannical behavior, of the sufferings of the commons condemned to labor underground clearing or constructing ditches, and sewers of gallant Romans, soldiers who had beaten in battle all neighboring peoples, robbed of their swords, and turned into stone cutters and artisans. He reminded them of the foul murder of Servius Tullius, of the daughter who drove her carriage over her father's corpse in violation of the most sacred of relationships, a crime which God alone could punish. Doubtless, he told them, of other and worse things brought to his mind in the heat of the moment, and by the sense of his latest outrage, which still lived in his eye and pressed upon his heart, but a mere historian can hardly record them. The effect of his words was immediate. The populace took fire and were brought to demand the abrogation of the king's authority and the exile of himself and his family. With an armed body of volunteers, Brutus then marched for Ardea to rouse the army to revolt. Lucretius, who some time previously had been appointed by the king prefect of the city, was left in command in Rome. Tullia fled from the palace during the disturbances. Wherever she went, she was met with curses. Everyone, men and women alike, called her down upon her head the vengeance of the Furies who punish sinners against the sacred ties of blood. When news of the rebellion reached Ardea, the king immediately started for Rome to restore order. Brutus got wind of his approach and changed his route to avoid meeting him, finally reaching Ardea almost at the same moment as Tarquin arrived at Rome. Tarquin found the city gates shut against him, and his exile decreed. Brutus, the liberator, was enthusiastically welcomed by the troops, and Tarquin's sons were expelled from the camp. Two of them followed their father into exile at Carrari in Etruria. Sextus Tarquinius went to Gabai, his own territory, as he doubtless hoped, but his previous record there of robbery and violence had made him many enemies, who now took their revenge and assassinated him. Tarquin the Proud reigned for twenty-five years. The whole period of monarchical 
government from the founding of Rome to its liberation was 244 years. After the liberation, two consuls were elected by popular vote under the presidency of the prefect of the city. The voting was by centuries, according to the classification of Servius Tullius. The two consuls were Lucius Junius Brutus and Lucius Tarquinius Colatinus.